I'm heading into Ozark this morning as we look at some real people right here in town doing some real things. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to have a conversation this morning with Dee Gilbert, local master gardener, who is just one of our local people doing local and real things. I'm sitting at the dining room table with Dee Gilbert, a local master gardener, and Dee has been so gracious to let us come into her home and talk with her a little bit about her love for gardening, and most especially her interest in composting and the benefits of composting and just exactly what she does. So I'm going to get Dee to talk to us just a little bit about composting, how she got interested uh, just a few little background items, if she would. Maybe, maybe you could tell us how long you've been a master gardener and where you began your gardening career. Well, my gardening career began back in Zone 10, Miami, Florida, probably around 1968, 1970. Um, I wanted to grow a garden. You could grow anything year-round in Miami seasons except maybe summer part of the summer because it's so buggy in the summer but what really got me interested in composting was the fact that they delivered to every household in our neighborhood a wonderful compost bin we all had a lot of trees in our yards and there was a lot of debris and it was really taxing the ecology in South Florida and they came up with the idea of compost bins so we put our leaves and yard trash in those bins and they gave us each this book which was so helpful if I had read it front to back at the beginning I would have saved myself a lot of mistakes <laughs> because it's very thorough and very well researched but one of the things that really sold me on compost was in my little garden I went to I saw some little plants that weren't doing very well. And I'd been reading about compost tea from the book. And I thought, well, how am I going to gather compost tea? This bin is sitting flat on a, a slab. How do you get the tea out of there? There was no spigot or anything convenient. So we put a plastic sheet under it, caught tea that way, and it was awkward. And I put the tea in a, in a bucket, and I poured that on my plants. I also used some of the compost to mix in with the plants, but the tea did the most ben benefit for the plants. Sickly looking, sad, somewhat diseased plants came to life, thrived, were healed from what I saw happening. I was sold on composting from then on. When we moved up here to South Alabama, we're dealing with a whole different ecology a different time or different growing zone. We're in zone eight here, not 10, which is tropical or subtropical. And I knew nothing about clay soils. I knew nothing about how to grow anything. And I heard about master gardeners. Well, I had a, a job at the time I was working, but as soon as I got retired from that job, I joined the master gardeners and I couldn't get over how much there was to learn. And I'm still learning. You just do not stop learning. There is so much to learn about the way plants work and how they grow and what their nutritional needs are and how you can produce a lot of those nutritional needs without having to use chemical fertilizers. So back to composting, I started my pile here and I decided I wanted to do piles. And at first I had a little brick wall around my pile in the first corner of the yard so it would be unattractive. But now I've just done away with the bricks. I have enlarged the pile to so much that I have this very large acorn squash growing out of it and I can still get compost out of the area when I go around the edges of where that plant has grown. taking compost out into the yard about once a day in the summer and probably about 
twice a week in the wintertime. Well, this is, uh, you know, it's extremely hot here in South Alabama. And when we talk about gardening in the summer, we just kind of sit inside in the air conditioning and mostly talk about it. But to compost is something that really, it's a gardening technique you work with year round. You absolutely do. Um, it's slower moving in the winter months, but it sure is wonderful to get me out of the house when it's cold and I really want to sit inside with a hot cup of tea. But I get myself out, I gather my compost bucket, and I go down to one of my piles, and I have three piles. But that gets me out and I'm always so grateful to be back outside, no matter how cold it is, because being in Alabama, I'm quite used to being warm and hot. <laughs> So wintertime is a challenge, but well, the compost needs to be done year round and that keeps the piles active and working. And then I, it's very, very usable. Well, we are right here on the first day of July when I, and it's 7.30 in the morning and it's already 75 degrees. So I'm just gonna follow you around and I want you to show me what you would typically do um, explaining as you go the benefits that compost provides, why in the world we would want to do it, and what are some of the things that are the do's and the don'ts. What do we work with and what's best left to go into the scrap pile. So Dee, I'm going to let you get started and I'm just going to follow you with my camera. That sounds good. Um, I learned more from what I did wrong than what I did right. And so I have a lot of wrong things to show you out in the yard. Um, and every one of them was a very good lesson for me. Uh, and I'm a slow learner, so it's taken me a two or three years to catch up on some things to figure out what was going on. But wonderful thing is nature keeps on going. No matter how many mistakes I make, God makes it so every single thing still grows and still gives us good food in spite of all my mistakes. And I feel very good about using my compost, which is right here in this bucket. I have, now I just put it out last night, but here again this morning, I, since then I've peeled some onions, I have some uh, uh, fruit skins, lemon and mandarin. I have some tea bags in here and um, I use I put eggshells in here, but I don't put eggshells whole anymore. I learned that they don't break up quite so fast. So I crunch them up with a little cruncher and I use crunched eggshells, more tea bags, vegetable clippings, even some things off my gardenia. I plucked some brown leaves off of it last night, but all of those things are going in this little bucket. People ask me, won't gnats get into your house because of that? Yep, yeah, they get in, so at night, sometimes I'll just leave the bucket with it slightly off. Gnats will go in there very happily first thing in the morning, I slam it on, take it outside, and let the gnats go. If I wait too long, and I did this yesterday, there was little gnat larvae all over on the top of the bucket. I looked at that, and I thought, what is that? but I had some old compost in here that was a couple days old, and that's because it's summer, and summer fruits seem to attract larvae a lot faster than that. So I should have taken it out a day earlier. So do you take it out every day, um, mainly to keep down any kind of pests or anything? Um, that's the best way to do it, daily. Um, I don't always have a lot of clippings. If we go out to eat or if we're away from home, um, then we're not using as much, I'm not cutting up as many veggies, as, and so I don't have as much compost. In that case, I just keep that thing sealed up real tight, and I wait until I can empty it. Well, when I look in your compost bucket, I notice not all of your kitchen scraps are in there. What are the things we want to make sure don't go in the compost bucket? That's a great question. You do not want to put anything that's greasy, nothing with meat or bones, and you certainly don't want to put in anything that um, has dairy in it, like milk, um, milk products, 
eggs are great, egg shells are great. Uh, some things I don't even put in the garden. Um, let me show you something that you can do with your cuttings. You can grow new things. Come right out here, I'll show you one of them. The other one's in my kitchen, I'll go get that. But right here is celery. I grew from cutting off the bottom of the celery and I put it in a little bit of water and when it got big enough, I put it in the pot and now I have a nice little celery branch. So what you don't compost, you simply recycle and have you had it grow on out the celery to the point that you found the usable stalks? I did, um, a, a year or so ago, I did, I took it and I put it in my raised beds, which are over there. And I had those raised beds filled with mushroom compost and I added um, regular soil in with it, mixed it with some sand and I put the celery in there and I had celery about as tall as my shoulders growing up out of there. Oh wow. It got a little tough because <laughs> I didn't harvest it soon enough but it was great the way it grew and that came just from cutting off the bottom of the celery stalk that I brought home from the store. Did you wait for the stalk to root? Yes. So you put it like in a saucer of water maybe? Yes, I did. And I set it on the kitchen windowsill and I kind of watched it. It does. It's amazing how fast you see those celery stalks come back up. Within a day, you'll see little shoots coming out of the center of that, that base you cut off. It's fascinating how fast it goes and just with water. And there are some people that will do it just in the water. I like to have a little extra nutrition that comes from my soil so I eventually put it outside and it'll get a lot bigger and bushier. And the leaves are wonderful in salad besides. See how healthy these are. And these are, this is with soil mixed with compost. I don't use straight compost, I use it mixed with compost. And using a few little, I try to keep it covered with pine straw. And this is the outcome of using pine straw. Oh. <laughs> You get little p baby pine trees. Now you can plant your tree. Right, except we're trying not to have any more of that forest <laughs> in the backyard. <laughs> oh, this is great. Well, that was a little freebie there. Um, are you ready to head out to your pile? Let me get you one more thing to show you from one of my kitchen uh, okay. growings. I, I cut some, and you can follow me in the kitchen if you want. Green onions are so easy to grow. And here they are. And I just took the green onions bottoms that I cut off, put them in the jar with a little water, and they're sprouting right back up. And I've cut these a few times to put in my salads or in my cooking. And as soon as I cut them, I start seeing them grow again. So you can see there's some little new little baby ones in there. So yeah. it's perpetual if you never pull the root. It is perpetual um, and because the roots come as you buy them in the store and you, you usually don't eat the roots. But I put them in a little jar, stand them upright, and I don't add a lot of water, but you can see the roots in the bottom of that. So I have my ready-made green onions. Do you ever take those out and put in the ground or do you just keep it there I in the have, windowsill? Uh, I have done that, but I'm a messy gardener and sometimes they get lost in my garden and I don't find them. So this time I'm gonna keep them in the kitchen on the sink. Other things that can go in your compost pile cardboard tubes, toilet paper tubes, paper towel tubes, wrapping paper tubes. Just flatten them up, fold them over. I put them in the pile. I, sometimes I'll just stick them in here because I'm not ready to go to the pile yet. So in the bucket they'll go. And I never see them again once I put them in the compost pile. It's amazing how fast they break down. Oh wow. They are considered a brown 
compost consists of greens and browns. That's nitrogen producing elements and carbon producing elements. And the brown things, which leaves that fall down under the bushes and the trees and are naturally decaying, you need to add a good bit of the carbon in relation to the nitrogen things you put in your pile. And that will keep your pile from smelling. It will keep it alive and active. And uh, it's got to be a good balance. So mostly carbon things, the rotted leaves, what they call leaf mold, and uh, cardboard tubes, paper, shredded paper, um, lint from the dryer, eggshells, all can go in your compost pile. Those are the browns. Those are the things that break down very fast. They're already working. As soon as they hit the soil, those little microbes get to work and start munching on them, and, they're, and they disappear in almost no time. The nitrogen things, they, they're so important to add. And everything in this bucket is a nitrogen item, except for the cardboard tube and the eggshells. But the tea bags, the um, coffee grounds, the, um, all the veggie cuttings, fruit skins, all of those things, those are the, the green things. When you add your tea bags and your coffee grounds, do you add the filter paper as well? Absolutely. Let me show you. I have some very nice neighbors who help me out and friends, and they bring me their coffee grounds. I don't drink coffee myself, so I beg, and they bring me coffee packs in the filters. Now this is a, an old box I had in the house and it's still got unused filters. But the coffee grounds are wonderful fertilizer and they're a natural. And then this one is one a friend brought me, full of old coffee filters and grounds, all mixed up. And sometimes I just pour water in there and then pour a little bit into my watering can that adds great fertilizer. So just putting like steeping you would steep your uh, water for your watering your plants in the grounds and then just use it that way? I do, and I'll show you exactly how I do that. And that's where I'm gonna take you out to the yard and show you how we do that. I have a little bucket that I can tie a little compost filter in. It's right here. It's just an old stocking, and I put <laughs> compost in it. That old stocking might be the hardest thing to find. <laughs> <laughs> it could be an old sock, and that would work just as well. I used to use uh, those little mesh bags that you get from the grocery store with oranges in them, mm -hmm. but now they're making them out of plastic that disintegrates so fast you can hardly get it out of your house before it's spilling everywhere. So this works very well, and being a, a stocking or a sock, it'll hold up for quite a long time. And I put that in my watering can, put water in it. That's compost in here. That is already uh, broken down, decomposed, mature compost in there. And I'll show you where I get that out of as we go out into the yard. And I fill up my water bucket. I let it sit for a little while, not long. If I'm in a hurry, I'll mush this up and down, shake it around, swirl it in there. And I'll have nice brown, let's see if I've got some coming out. Yep, you see the color? Nice brown compost tea coming out of there. And that compost tea is so rich, so full of nutrients. I have seen it. Now this poor little gardenia is a good example. It got pretty sickly for a while. And uh, I won't go into what I did to it to make it do that, but I did it. But compost tea has brought it back it's very leggy now because the sun isn't getting on it much. It's on, on the porch. If I put it out in the sun in the summer, it doesn't do well. It thrives with winter time. It loves the summer winter, uh, the sun in the winter that comes through the porch when it's in full sun then. Right now, it's going. it needs to be cut back, and I hope some gard gardener who knows how to do geraniums really well. But I've had this plant for probably five or six years and it's still doing well. Compost tea is what keeps it alive. <laughs> it gets a lot of nutrition. Another thing I've done that's helped that, and it helps my tomato plants, is take my eggshells, 
grind them up in the blender, add a little water, make eggshell tea, and pour that on the plant and on the tomato plants. It's a very good boost for strengthening your plants. So you don't strain it, you just sort of pulverize the eggshell, steep it, and the whole works goes right. on your tomato plants. Exactly. And if there's, uh, when there's crumbs left in the bottom, pull out the eggshell bits that are left, put it down in the ground around your tomato plants. Uh, to blossom end rot is a common disease with tomatoes. And if you pour that calcium from the eggshells down around there, you will not get it. I told that to my next door neighbor who's growing them. He said, I always get this problem with blossom end rot. And I said, I'll tell you what you do. And I told him about the eggshells. He said he did that and he said he had the best tomatoes. He said it did not happen this year. So that was a plus to be able to share it with somebody. I love sharing my little tips that I learned from other people.